Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Out and Equal 2018 Virtual Summit Series. This is Isabel Porras, Out and Equal University Director. This is a one-hour broadcast audio call uh, from 11 a.m. Uh, to 12 p.m. Pacific, so please make sure you've turned on your speakers or headphones and that your volume is all the way up. If you have any trouble uh, signing in, you can uh, dial us with the number that's on the screen or chat in and we will help you. Of course, if you have any questions or comments during the call, please use the chat box on the left-hand side to share those with us and with the speakers. As always, we'll be recording this webinar and along with the slide deck, it will be made available to you after the call. Before we begin today's conversations, I want to share a few announcements really quickly. The uh, town call series continues next week uh, with, or excuse me, next month with the March 22nd kickoff for our 2018 Workplace Summit. This call will provide the planning details for your team, key dates and locations. We'll be discussing the workshop proposal process, including some new additions there. Um, of course, we'll be discussing the Audi Awards, details on registration and housing, and what new things you can expect at this year's summit. So whether this is your first or your tenth workplace summit, this call will provide you with tools to create a value-added experience. Highly recommend that you attend or at the very least that you designate someone from your organization uh, to listen in. You should have already received an invitation to that town call. If you haven't, please dial in and we will connect with you. You can also uh, access it directly from our website. The virtual summit series continues next month in April with our uh, friends from Dell uh, presenting on transforming transitioning, what you can do for your transgender employees. Again, look out for these invitations shortly. As always, you can chat in or you can email university at outandequal.org with any questions you may have. With that, let's turn to today's virtual summit. I'm so pleased to introduce Ryan Everson and Laura Martin from Northwestern Mutual. Allies are an important contingent in the struggle for LGBTQ plus rights and workplace inclusion, and in today's webinar, Getting Sassy, Tapping the Power of Visible Allies at Work, Ryan and Laura uh, will explore why visible allies are critical to fostering an inclusive workplace, why calling yourself an ally is different than quote unquote acting in visible allyship, how you can make a plan to take back to your team, and how to prepare for the consequences, both good and bad, of visibility. They'll share tactical steps that allies can take to support, advocate, speak out, and stand up in visible allyship for their LGBTQ plus colleagues as told from a bisexual and straight perspective. So allies, it's time to get sassy. With that, I'll turn it over to Ryan and Laura. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel, and thank you everybody for joining. You did take my sassy line, but that's okay. Um, I am pleased to welcome you all to our presentation, as Isabel said, on how to get sassy. This is an adaptation of a session we had the privilege to present last year in Philadelphia at Doubt and Equal Workplace Summit, and uh, we're excited to jump into it. So with that, I will echo her point and let the sass begin. Quick housekeeping point, uh, we have uh, questions and answers important to us, and so we have earmarked time at the end. Don't feel like you have to wait until the end. Uh, there's a chat box that we'll be able to keep an eye on. Uh, so chat your questions in there. If we don't answer it in line, we will pick it up as best we can at the end. As mentioned, I'm Ryan Everson. I am in the digital experience part of Northwestern Mutual's wealth management area. And I am Laura Martin. I work in our planning and sales area at Northwestern Mutual. Just a little bit about Northwestern Mutual. We started 161 years ago as a life insurance company. This is literally a picture of our original building on Wisconsin Avenue, which is a main street that runs through downtown Milwaukee. To give you an idea of where we have gone, we now, our LGBT ERG now has over 500 members. Additionally, we have scored 100% for the HRC CEI index three years in a row. We have been one of the top fundraisers in Milwaukee for the AIDS uh, fundraising walk. And one of our moments of pride was after what happened with the Pulse nightclub shooting 
in 2016, Northwestern Mutual, for half of June, lit up the columns. Again, we are located on the main street through the city of Milwaukee, so that brought a ton of recognition. So you can just look at the buildings to see how far we have come. All right, so why are we here today? Um, we'll use the journey and the depiction you see on the screen of the journey that we've taken both individually as Laura and Ryan and our journey together as a personal and evolving embodiment of the power and need for visible allies in the workplace and in the lives of each of us. We'll share how we got here, why we believe so strongly in the power and need for visible allies, lessons we've learned along the way, some of which we learned the hard way, and conclude with some of the actionable points that you can take away back to your workplaces, to your teams, to your leadership, but also personally that you can use. One other quick point, we are not experts or particularly different from any of you. Uh, we have been blessed with this journey together, which really started in earnest for us in Out in Equals uh, Orlando conference two years ago, uh, and a number of people have helped us along the way to get to where we are. So let's start with where we are. Part of that is understanding and knowing our audience. So we have our first polling question to ask you. We thank you for your willingness to answer this question. It's always good to know who we're speaking to. We strive to be fully inclusive and recognize this is not a perfect question. So we'll give you a couple of minutes couple of moments to answer. One other point too, other slash not listed can also be used as prefer not to answer. We recognize that that is uh, absolutely okay too. So if, prefer not to if you prefer not to answer, certainly feel free to use that other not listed as such. I don't know if Laura, Laura and Brian, you can see the results on, on the screen now, but about half of the participants have, have um, shared their information, and it looks like we have a pretty good mix of LGBTQ folks as well as straight allies on the call. Excellent. Fantastic. Well, welcome again. So let's hop to the next poll if we can. Do you consider yourself a visible ally? Responses coming in fast and furious. Now that I see where to look, that's amazing. Thank you all for answering. All right, so it looks like about 60% of you are uh, answering yes, um, about 10% are saying no, and about 40% are. Uh, saying I am a member of the community. Um, you're probably also saying I am terrible at math, uh, which is fair. Um, call it on-the-fly math. <laughs> Thank you again. Particularly, uh, so for this, this is helpful for us as a level set as we see where this goes. But also, for those of you who indicated no, I want to thank you for your honesty, really. On behalf of all allies, we've all been there, uh, so I appreciate you being here. All right, so... Okay, so working on the technology. There we go, preview for you. So we want to talk about who we are and also how, we, how we're perceived, uh, talk a little bit about ourselves and, uh, and then where that shows. So I am a Texan, I am a word nerd, preview alert, you'll see that on display. I'm a logical minded perfectionist, I am indeed not that into sports. I'm insatiably curious, I love learning, I love challenging myself, asking dumb questions, and happy to be corrected when wrong. Uh, just how I live my life, but it's also been incredibly helpful on our journey, and my journey particularly. I am a Christian, and as such I strive to love and appreciate all people because I truly believe and know that God's love is all-encompassing. I am a husband, happily married to my partner for almost six years. I am a father to a precocious two-year-old, and I am a friend. I am also a heterosexual.
But that goes without saying because in our society it's the default assumption. I am Ryan. And I am Laura, and I do want to uh, circle back quickly to the ally question. And yes, somebody asked whether or not, um, or commented that they are both a member of the community and a visible ally. That's a little spoiler alert, but thank you. That's a great comment. So I'm a Midwesterner, born and raised in Wisconsin, quite proud of my Midwest accent. I am also a nature lover. I love being outside. Those of you who know me know that the glass is usually overflowing. It's not just half full, it is overflowing. I'm an eternal optimist and a social justice junkie. So from the time I was very young in my suburban upbringing, I was the, the person wearing now t-shirts and save the environment and all of those kinds of things. I am also a bisexual. I am Laura. And I have found on this journey that once I come out as bisexual, that's how I'm defined. Everything else falls away. When I started at Northwestern Mutual, I immediately got involved with our LGBT ERG. As I mentioned, social justice junkie. I was excited to bring that part of myself to work. Shortly after I joined, we were promoting a local LGBTQ leadership conference. And I remember distinctly feeling really nervous about having flyers at my desk. I worked really hard to stay closeted. I wanted to protect my identity. That was part of the, the cost of the closet. I would constantly say and do things so nobody would wonder whether or not I was a member of the community. Even though I was incredibly active and engaged with our LGBT ERG, I was wearing the rainbow lanyard and doing all of those things. I didn't truly understand the cost of the closet until I was no longer in the closet. You know, more than 30% of people note that when they are closeted, they felt more depressed and less engaged at work. Equally as many seek out new employment because they don't feel that their work environment is welcoming. These statistics come from the HRC. While I was living a closeted life, I had known since a very young age that I had physical and emotional attraction to both men and women. I just worked really hard at keeping myself and my life a secret including referring to my then girlfriend as just a friend. On a side note, while she and I are no longer together, I think it's important to note that I made amends to her when I came out. To say that my life has changed since I've come out is a huge understatement. I was particularly scared to come out as bi. Bi's don't fit any, anywhere. Friends in the community say, just choose. Friends outside of the community say, oh, you can now date anyone. Bi invisibility is real. Bi discrimination is real. It exists in and outside of the community. Like many things, I didn't realize this until I was personally affected so deeply. Some of the things I hear speak to the next polling question. And I want to share personally with these questions, and I understand this question may be challenging to answer. I just want everyone to know that I've personally thought a number of these things on this list. I'd echo that too as folks are reading through and answering. Um, there's no shame in answering honestly. Uh, if I do, I'd check pretty much all of them. The important thing is having the awareness of how these thoughts and words impact others. I think in an academic sense I did, uh, but as I've gotten to know Laura, I've become close friends with her and realized the ways that these seemingly offhand comments can truly hurt her 
uh, it really humanized this and, and hit home for me the impact of this, these sorts of flippant comments, uh, and it's important to raise awareness of the impact they have. Okay. So we'll give folks another second or two to answer. Every time we do this, I just have to feel so proud at the honesty and vulnerability, not just with Ryan and I, but the audience. All of you are in this with us. And the more honest we can all be, the better we can all be. So thank you for that. So bisexuality, as the definition that we like to use, is the capacity for emotional, romantic, or physical attraction to one or more gender or sex. When I hid under the disguise of straight, I was not co constantly sexualized. If I talked about my weekend, people didn't think about sex. An HRC study found that more than 80% of non-LGBT folks want people to feel co comfortable coming out at work. Be yourself. However, more than 50% of them do not want to hear about your social life if you are a member of the LGBT community. Over time, as I have shared my story with others, I felt the need to continually let people know that while I was married, I was in a monogamous marriage. I would say, I'm bisexual. Oh, and by the way, while I was married, I was monogamous because I got the question over and over and over again. Did you have a girlfriend? When you had a girlfriend, did you have a boyfriend? More than 50% of bi folks express that they stay closeted because of others within the community and the perception that they may have. A really good friend of mine who is a lesbian shared that she didn't really understand bisexuality until she watched me on my own journey. And she admitted that before she met me, she thought, just choose, which I completely understand. There's a quote that I really love. Instead of a closet, bisexuals come out of a Narnia wardrobe because when they come out, no one believes them or the things they have experienced. Oh, and quickly, somebody asked about the cost of the closet. Um, that is an excellent question. In my opinion, the cost of the closet is how I kept myself hidden, and as a result of staying hidden, the cost of depression. So by the time I came out, I was so incredibly depressed. I was practically suicidal. I was less engaged at work. I was not allowing my true self to shine. Um, if you want to shoot me an email, I can send you a number of statistics about the cost of the closet, and I would love to talk to you more about that. All right, so let's talk about finding our way through the dark. I am a heterosexual, cisgender, white, middle class, college educated, employed, American male, with no criminal history, and without current physical or mental impairments who can wear my sign of faith without fear. Clearly, I sit smack in the middle of a number of concentric circles of privilege. I grew up in Texas to a loving and welcoming family, though I don't recall us talking much about sexual orientation. It just wasn't a topic I felt impacted me or anyone I knew. Now, statistically speaking, that's unlikely, but goes to show uh, both how, how much I had ignorance around that and really how pervasive the systems of oppression are that keep folks in the closet. So how did I get from there to where I am now on my journey? A number of points along the way and innumerable folks who've helped me coach and learn. But I'd like to share the story about how I came to the epiphany that really shifted how I think about myself and being an ally. I was working at a consulting company and quickly fell in with two friends whom I'll call John and Jane. Truth be told, I rather fancied Jane, um, but it was also 
um, <laughs> a bit of an uphill challenge. To say that I have game is probably a bit of an overstatement, uh, which you can't see the fact that I put that in air quotes is probably also a tip off. Nonetheless, I was irked to have a I was starting to feel that John was a lot closer to Jane than I was, and so I, uh, quote unquote, rose to the challenge. Sexism alert. And over the next few months, set about wooing her. One night, the three of us were getting ready to hit the town and pre gaming, and Jane left, leaving John and I in the room. And apropos of nothing, he came over and said, I just want you to know I love Jane like a sister. I was taken aback, to say the least. I mean, can you believe the nerve of this guy? Like, I'm going to believe that dirty trick. Like, I really think that's him saying that. He's just trying to throw me off my game. So I brushed it off, probably made some fake nice, oh, okay, yeah, sure, sounds great, comment, and went on with my evening with nary a second thought. As you can probably guess, John is gay. Did not. After months of working together, playing together, in a conservative job at a conservative company in a conservative city. He finally mustered the courage to come out to his friend the best way that he could, only to have me throw it in his face without even knowing it. It was months later that Jane mentioned offhand, oh, well, given that John is gay, I stopped. I have no idea what she said after that. You ever have one of those moments where it feels like you stand still and the world pivots around you? That was one of those moments for me. I felt horrified, and that quickly gave way to shame. Who knows what I had said, maybe it hurt him, and then just deep, deep sadness. Here was my friend trying to share his authentic self with me after months of hiding it, no doubt for fear of my reaction. And I effectively slammed the door shut right in his face, reinforcing every fear he'd had of coming out. It's crushing still. The shame and pain I feel today still is raw. But in a sense, I want to cultivate that and remember it and use it as a touchstone so that I never forget how much damage my biases can do even without knowing it. It also illustrates how ingrained heterosexism and by extension cisgenderism is. And just as a quick point, when I say cisgender, that's a term um, trans, comp compared to transgender, uh, cisgender is where you uh, identify as the same birth, uh, the same sex at which you were assigned at birth. So transgender would be uh, my gender identity does not match the sex I was assigned at birth. I am cisgender, which means that my gender identity as male does match the sex to which I was assigned at birth. Thank you for the question on that one as well. As I look at those it just never occurred to me whether John was gay. He was a guy, and guys like girls. Um, so I really like this visual, and it does say pillars of heteronormativity, and I would add cis-normativity. Again, thinking about the concept that heterosexual relations, cisgender relations are the norm. So as I've learned, as you look down this, you know, almost from birth, with the, the pronouncement, it's a boy, it's a girl, it really sets a path of expectations, societal norms, and you know, what's quote unquote defined as normal. These are the unconscious biases that establish and enforce the systems of oppression that deprive LGBTQ plus folks of equality. It's not, an, it's not true and it's not the ultimate determinant that if you were assigned sex as male at birth, that that is gonna be your gender identity. It's also not true that if you identify as female, that your gender expression is going to be feminine. The fact that these show up as quote unquote normal is part of the issue because that by definition means if it's not this, it's abnormal. I'm not going to run down each of these, but I ask you to read through them and reflect on what that means to be in a heteronormative and cisnormative world. Another point, just coming back to my introduction, did anyone notice? that I referred to my wife as my partner? Did that strike you as odd? If so, that was you bumping up against heteronormativity. So let's make this a bit more pointed. I'd like to ask the allies in the room, or various rooms across the country, a few questions. And I want you to monitor your internal responses. Don't, don't post them in the chat. <laughs> Pay attention to your gut reaction and think about what this means given what we just discussed. Does it reveal unconscious biases? 
It certainly did for me. First question. So, when did you first come out to your parents as straight? How'd they take it? Feels funny, huh? Second question. At what age did you realize that you were heterosexual? How did you know? Were you sure? And last one. Is it possible that this heterosexuality thing is just a phase that you may grow out of? I think the last point I'll, I'll put on this is, despite how it feels in the, today's environment, uh, the vast majority of folks are not actively discriminating against LGBTQ folks. But that's actually a, the issue is that either through laziness, apathy, ignorance of unconscious biases, or not bothering to care enough to think about it, we are complicit in this oppression. It's not, that, not necessarily the actively discriminating folks who do the most damage. It's those of us who either unconsciously or subconsciously reinforce quote unquote normal uh, and therefore establish and perpetuate those systems of oppression. All right, before we take a step forward, I want to quickly address one of the questions, which was how important is it to have consistent leadership at the ERG level to be able to build on progress as opposed to rotating leadership of the ERG group? That is a really tough question to answer. We here have a rotation of a two-year term. And for our chair and vice chair, there is usually at least a year overlap. We tend to have our working committees have a lot of overlap. So for example, Ryan and I are both on the governance teams right now. In the future, we will, instead of, net, you know, we'll, we'll, we both roll off next year, instead of being on the governance team so we can allow others to rise, to that occasion, we will help be on committees. So hopefully that help answers your question a little bit. If you want to talk more about this, again, please feel free to step forward. So anyways, coming out and stepping up, a little bit about what happened with Ryan and I. So for the definition of ally, we like to use the acronym of SAS, partly because it's kind of fun to say get sassy. I admit it. Those of you who know me well know that that is not at all shocking that I would enjoy that uh, little, little saying. So SAS is to stand up, advocate, support, and speak out in solidarity with somebody in a marginalized group. Acting in allyship is more than just calling yourself an ally. It is something that somebody in the marginalized group must confer upon you. And again, as somebody else so eloquently pointed out, being in the um, community does not necessarily mean that you can't be an ally. So thank you for that foresight that she had. So a little bit about Ryan and I. Where we work, lunch is sort of a thing. And as Ryan and I started to work together more on different projects, I invited him to lunch to get to know him better. He's one of those people that naturally puts you at, le at ease. He has this face that you can trust. So we were sitting in the cafeteria one day right next to a pillar, which was awesome because it was one of the few tables that wasn't surrounded by other tables who could hear your entire conversation. I'd been at NM for a few months and the weight of my secret was starting to get really heavy. As I said, I had a girlfriend and I was hiding it. As Laura and I reflected on our journey together as we were putting together this presentation and others like it, it's, it was interesting how vividly we both remembered that day, even though we didn't talk about it for months afterwards. I remember it just as clearly. We're sitting at lunch. We were essentially at a table where we had a good amount of privacy. And at one point, she just leaned in and very quietly said, I'm the B. And I was just overwhelmed with love. Love for her. Gratitude that she would trust me enough to confide in me something like that. A feeling of, of intense happiness and closeness to her at such an intimate sharing. Um, 
but quickly followed by a real sense of sadness uh, that here was this person whom I had grown into close friends with, uh, and there was this entire portion of her being that I had no visibility to. I uh, didn't even know. I mean, I, had, I didn't even question. I had no idea. I just assumed heteronormativity. I assumed she was straight. And the fact that she had to lean in, the fact that she whispered, and the fact that she couldn't even bring herself to say bisexual, she just said the B. It just, it really broke my heart. The power of that experience for both of us continues to impact our journey together today. So what happened after that day is Ryan and I continued to grow our friendship, getting closer and closer, and we were both lucky enough to go to Out and Equal in 2016 in Orlando. Lance Bass spoke. Mm-hmm. Yep, he did. Yep, Lance Bass. And he spoke about the importance of visibility and his experience trying to live a closeted life while on tour with his band. I totally lost it. I couldn't hide anymore. The pain of hiding had reached the tipping point where the fear of, where the fear of coming out was less than the pain of hiding. I decided in that moment that I needed to come out. I couldn't live the way I was living anymore. Coming out to my colleagues and family and friends has been one of the most difficult things I've ever done and will continue to do because it's not a one and done kind of deal. My dad begged me not to come out. He was afraid for me. He was afraid of how people would treat me. He was afraid of how it would affect my career. Coming out has affected my life in ways I couldn't have possibly intended anticipated and continues to do so today. I'd gotten really, really good at flying below the radar. Owning all of who I am means that I have to start seeing what others saw in me. I can't hide behind the safety of my secret. It affects us all. I think it's been incredibly, I feel very privileged to have been part of Laura's journey. Uh, both as friends before I knew she was by being there as part of her coming out journey personally, and then to really see her lean in and uh, you know spread herself and who she truly is, own it, and being courageous along the ways, right? As I've heard others say, you don't come out once, you come out all the time. To the same people come out every day so I think just the courage that she's continued to, to demonstrate has been incredibly powerful to see and I've been very thankful to be a part of it I think it's also been incredibly educational for me because I, I think probably I, I thought allies were one of those folks who sort of help cheerlead you until you've come out of the closet and it's like great all right good job next one and and as I've learned this it it really has hit me that allyship deepens greatly as folks have come out of the closet. And being there as part of Laura's journey and alongside her throughout this coming out journey, but especially as she's come out afterwards and in the year and a half since she's come out publicly. I think it's been, uh, as she mentioned, transformative. You look at how she's grown into herself. She's bringing her whole self to work. Uh, you know, She was in a, at a decent job, doing a decent job of it, but as she looks at this, uh, she's grown as a professional. She has become much more successful. Uh, she's gotten a promotion that many thought was not possible, and it was done with gratitude and welcoming. She has been uh, taking increased responsibility because folks have asked her to, because they see that there's something about her, because as she steps into her whole self, she can become the focused and smart and dedicated woman that is a, an effective professional. And just having the ability to sit back and watch her grow has been really humbling. Uh, and, and I'd like to say, too, as we step back, right, take it beyond just our journey and think about what if all the folks that, that you know, if, you, if you're in the community uh, or if you're an ally and you think of the folks you know that are in the community, if folks are able to bring their whole selves to work, just the transformative impact that could have on our collective businesses. This is not a talk about 
just about the value of allies to LGBTQ folks. It, it is also specifically the powerful impact that has on our businesses in the workplace. The amount of productivity and personal engagement and satisfaction, you know, Laura loving her job because she's finally stepping into and owning who she is, and people are responding to that because authenticity is so much more compelling than punching the clock and hiding who you are. And it's it's been interesting to see and have her come back to her dad, uh, who, to his defense, has been one of her ardent supporters. But you know, his first concern was, you're going to ruin your career. You got this great job at Northwestern Mutual, and yet now she's so much more successful, so much more well-respected because, not despite, coming out. So we talked about why it's important for folks like Laura to have visible allies, but what does that really mean? My journey growing in my allyship has been powerful. Laura's journey embracing and loving her true self has been powerful, but our journey together has been so much more powerful. It started with visibility, by which I mean more than just wearing rainbows. Though in truth, that does help. I love rainbows. Acting in allyship is not being an ally. Laura mentioned that, and I think it's worth reiterating. You can call yourself an ally, but if no one in the community knows it, you are not acting in allyship. As we've gone through our journey and reflected on this and really building the narrative around our journey for ourselves and for others, these are the traits that have shaken out. Uh, we aren't going to go through all of these I will say, though, that as part of the materials that will come out with the presentation, we do have these, this list along with some additional commentary on each as a PDF that will be shared. The, um, a couple that I'll pull out. Number six, cultivate brokenheartedness. I think it can be easy for allies to shut out the bad things going on today, and there are a lot of bad things going on today that impact the LGBTQ plus community and other minority communities and disadvantaged communities. As painful as it is, allies should seek this out and embrace the outrage, embrace the sadness, embrace the vehement anger so that you can funnel it for a useful purpose. It's so easy for allies to take their ally hat off at the end of the day. We have the privilege of not caring, whereas our brothers and sisters who are LGBTQ plus community have to deal with this. They are faced with this. This is discrimination against their very lives. The other one I want to talk about is allocentrism, number 12. Word nerd, right? This is a term I borrowed from economics, and I really love it. It means prioritizing the collective self over the private self, especially when these two are in conflict. The last one I want to talk a little bit about, too, and I know Laura has something to comment also, is uh, number 11, acknowledging your privilege. As allies, it's hard to do. It feels really uncomfortable, but you should do it. You don't have to be apologetic or guilt-stricken, but you have to be comfortable talking about it and the impact it's had on others who don't have that privilege. You have to acknowledge that for authenticity's sake, uh, and also I would say to recognize the strength that comes as an ally that can use that privilege to advance the fight against systems of oppression. I want to speak to a couple really quickly as well. One of them is number 11, acknowledging my privilege, and this sort of speaks to intersectionality. So I am a white woman, and I can be an ally to my LGBTQ friends of color as well as just in general my friends of color. I am constantly looking at ways that my privilege affects my life and calling attention to it. Whether it's making me uncomfortable or not, I think it's important to acknowledge it and I try to be really, really mindful of not attaching any shame to that because shame is not helpful. It is not helpful to me or anyone else. The other one that I really want to call attention to is number one, be visible. So the best way to illustrate this is I bought a really awesome T-shirt at a feminist store in Milwaukee that says, you can pee next to me. And it is, it was printed in, after what happened in North Carolina. And one Saturday morning, my son, who is a competitive gym, gymnast, he's nine and adorable and, and gymnastics at that age is really cute, I had it on. And we were getting ready to go to one of his meets. And I thought, oh, gosh, maybe I should take this T-shirt off. 
because I don't want to offend people at his gymnastics meet, right? And then I thought, nope, I am not taking this T-shirt off. I am keeping this T-shirt on because one of three things is going to happen. Some people likely looked at me with that you can pee next to me T-shirt on with disgust. Some people looked at me with that T-shirt on and had no idea what it meant. And some people looked at me with that T-shirt on and felt an immediate connection and felt like I was somebody that they could trust. And so being visible means doing things like that, whether it's at work or out in the community. It's in our daily lives. There are a lot of questions coming in. So I want to. So I, I've been looking through these, and I, I want to hold on some of these until the Q and A. But I think there's one that makes sense, Laura, for you to address. So the question was, how often do CEOs, senior management, etc., publicly support the ERGs with more than just lip service? Any real life examples of this? Oh, this is fantastic. Great question. Very timely. A couple of weeks ago, Ryan and I spoke at a local leadership conference. Actually, the one that I was afraid to put the flyers out. Uh, for a few years ago when I started at NM, and we had three members of our executive leadership team, so three people that report directly to the CEO of Northwestern Mutual that were in our session. More than that, um, our executive sponsor, who's fantastic, um, came up and introduced me to one of them, and um, we immediately forged a, forged a connection. I know that as I go to events, I was actually just at the African American membership meeting, and I sat at the same table with the president of Northwestern Mutual. Knowing that they are there makes a huge difference, at least for me in the community. And I think it makes it more comfortable, or at least I want to believe it makes it more comfortable for allies to feel that they can be fully engaged at work if they see senior leaders walking the walk. And I think one last thing before we move on is uh, that number one, actually be visible. A really effective campaign we had at Northwestern Mutual is to get rainbow lanyards. They're probably about an inch thick lanyards that say Northwestern Mutual with our logo and a series of heart stickers that are rainbow colored. Those are things that senior leaders have absolutely worn and gotten excited to wear. And, and it really matters, again, to Laura's point, um, as we get to leadership meetings and you see folks step on stage and they have a rainbow lanyard, it's pretty impressive. All right, so I just want to move. And so I guess the last question on this one before we move on is really, what does this mean to me? So personally as an ally, I want anyone who looks at me, thinks about me, no one should question whether I'll love and appreciate them for who they are. It is that being unfailably, unfailingly dependable in my allyship is what really motivates me, and that's, why, that's how I internalize all of these. So let's talk a little bit about acting invisible allyship is not painless. We'll start with the good. Deciding to act invisible allyship is immensely rewarding making a difference even if you never see it. The number of conversations we'll have that'll spawn out of this meeting that we may never be privy to. I myself have been uh, amazed to hear things that have others have taken away. Being a visible ally means doing it even though you may not see any benefit of doing so, knowing that it's there. Building bonds of friends and love and friendship, it's hard to understate the value of that. Uh, I have absolutely been a, become a better person and a better professional. I would say the ability to question my own biases is translated to my work life as well, uh, and I can really see different perspectives better. Subverting systems of oppression, I think that's probably my favorite. I have considerable privilege as a white male, as a college-educated, straight, cisgender person. I can walk halls, I can say things that others cannot, and my ability to do that is incredibly powerful. Folks listen to me even if they may not listen to Laura say the exact same thing. But there is a downside and there is a double-edged sword and I think it's important as you look to raise your visible allyship that you're aware of that. Discrimination by exclusion. Implicitly being a visible ally forces folks to answer questions they may not want to answer. 
and then that may, you may, they may resent that, they may try to avoid you, uh, they may oppose your viewpoint, and all of this can manifest in discrimination. You know, I, I think this is an important one to address, inaction for fear of blundering. That's true. You can misstep. I certainly have put my foot, more feet than I have in my mouth. <laughs> but I'd say genuineness, humility, and truly caring, those are very apparent. And if you come from that place, you're a lot more likely to get constructive feedback than to feel like you've irritated people with the questions. And relinquishing your privilege can hurt. Uh, when the rubber meets the road, so to speak, when you as an ally cede privilege that you didn't earn for folks who don't otherwise have it. So where do we go from here? Well, first off, thanks for coming along the journey with us. We really appreciate that. And as we continue to deepen our own growth, rise into the challenges and opportunities to share this message and help with folks like on this call, just thank you for that. And I guess my closing challenge is uh, first, recognize that our ally privilege comes at the expense of the marginalized and the oppressed. But standing in solidarity means actively pushing back on that privilege to the benefit of those groups. So put another way, if I grew up knowing all sorts of privilege, equality is going to feel uncomfortable. It's going to feel like it's oppression to me, and that's something that I need to square and we need to continually address. All right, so think about the question in the beginning and how you might have answered it, and then think about where you want to go. I'm going to kind of zip through these next slides because I really want to leave time for questions, and we have a lot of really great questions. So I challenge you all to think about what you can do. Make a commitment. You know, have somebody help you be accountable. Take action in the next seven days. So last polling question. Now hearing what we've said, do you feel like others in or outside the community would say that you act in visible allyship? So we're seeing a wider dispersion. Many you betchas, fantastic. Thank you. That's excellent to hear. A couple ums sometimes, <laughs> like I've been there. Hmm, good question. Got about 20 of those and 15, whoa, not sure anymore. And I really, I think this is, you know, one of the traits we mentioned was deliberate introspection. And if, we've, if we walk away from this presentation having prompted folks to really look inside and say, hey, this gives me construct to say, yeah, I'm a fantastic visible ally, that's awesome. And if you come away saying, oh, well, not sure anymore, that's even better. So thank you for that honesty. More green stuff, so that's good. <laughs> All right. So just run through a couple of references. Uh, these are things that we will see in the slides that go out, so I won't talk to each of these. Uh, the one point I'll mention, the documents we recommend, that first one is the one we referred to, the PDF. You should get a copy of that. The rest I, I highly recommend you Google and pull down. And Ryan and I are going to do our best to get to as many of these questions as we can, but if you have more, please don't be afraid to ask. If you want to know more about a question, if you want an accountability partner, please, please reach out to us. We have all of our contact information here. Never, ever forget that people's lives hang in the balance. You have a chance to stand up and fight for them, be visible, be approachable, take something actionable back with you. Punch down that voice of fear in your gut and run towards scary things. And above all, stand up, advocate, speak out, and support. So Q&A time. We're going to zip all the way back to the beginning and run through these as quickly as I can. So sometimes the GNLs of the LGBT community are the worst offenders when building an inclusive community. What advice do you have for those in the community that aren't bi but want to do better for ally, bi friends and colleagues? So I'm going to challenge this a little bit. And I feel uncomfortable and so I just want to welcome your feeling uncomfortable, if you will, with me. And share something that Ryan and I spoke about right before we started. Um, you know, I, I believe that I was born this way. 
Those of you who identify as gay or lesbian also believe that you were born that way. So one thing to think about is if you were born that way, why wasn't I? And if I was also born this way, think about putting yourself in my shoes. At the end of that summit that we just spoke at, um, a wonderful older gay man came up and gave me a, a ginormous hug. And he said, of all the letters, I'd hate to be you. Because he personally felt like we have the most difficult time of it. So being aware of those things, is something that I think that you can do for the bees and helping understand and help, you know, like stopping people when they make comments, even if it's uncomfortable. That's part of vulnerability. That's part of growth. So a couple other questions. I see one for um, this one. How do you handle the idea of promoting allyship without praising allies over LGBTQ plus folks? That's a fantastic question and an unfortunate one, um, an unfortunate situation. We struggle with that, to be honest. Uh, I, you know, I personally, I think it's it's really for you know we have a significant portion of our employee resource group are allies, and you know we struggle with how do we t how do we tip the balance so that there's more folks from in the community that are part of that. Uh, I think a lot of it is really educating the allies in a way that's we play a supporting role, and I think it's it's okay to call that out explicitly. That, you know, that it's not about us, and I think that's a hard message to hear. But as more and more, you know, as you look to leadership in the ERG, um, that that message coming from the top down, really reinforcing that the value of allies. That as an ally, I don't exist without folks like Laura, and I think it's that important to just continually articulate and challenge allies to really focus on visible allyship is servanthood. Mm -hmm. This is a good question. Does Northwestern Mutual have a week dedicated to by, by allyship or by awareness? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. Last year was the first year we did one singular day. Uh, we didn't do that much, but it was a start. And this year, we, there's actually two, two of us buys that are um, on the governance team. So it's something that um, we're going to try and change for this upcoming year to help create more visibility as, as we move forward. Uh, but I think it's important, you know, we, do, we, we celebrate um, Pride Month and do a lot, which is fantastic. But Again, often the B is excluded in that. One, so another question is, what, what is an action that allies for the bi community can take in order to build more inclusive environment for their colleagues? I think one of the biggest first steps is education and really understanding. Uh, you know, we went through that, that slide with the quotes that folks you know, have asked Laura and you know, innumerable other bisexual folks like her, and I honestly, if pressed, I don't know that I could have said no wholeheartedly that all of those were wrong until I got to know Laura, until I really started educating myself. Uh, there are a number of resources. We're happy you know, reach out to us. We're happy to share that. Uh, Laura read, recommended a couple books that I think are really um, valuable resources as well. I would say start with education, get plugged in, and make friends mm -hmm. uh, for folks that are already out. Mm -hmm. uh, and really just, you know, again, it's be respectful. You know, don't ask the kinds of questions that you can't Google, uh, but also recognize that there's an education of the head, and then there's an education of the heart, and you're not as successful if you only do one of those. Yeah, and you know, I've had some friends that have asked me if I can, I mean, obviously I can't speak for the bi community. I know that bi men have a heck of a lot more difficult time coming out than I do, cause, because they do. Um, so... But I have friends that have asked me if, if I'm open to being questioned, which I am. I will share, I always reiterate that it's based on my own experience. So I think it's important to share that way. Also, you know, with regard to the books, that conference we went to had a really great session on asexual that Ryan and I both went to. 
and they brought up a, a book that I had never even heard of. I really knew nothing about it. And now I'm, it's the invisible orientation and it's like my jaw drops. Um, and I just, I'm grateful to, to learn more so that I can be a better ally to my asexual friends. Uh, so Laura, how did you come out, quote, at work? I'm obviously part of our ERG, but don't want but don't specifically that I'm bi or an ally. So we have like a social media site um, called Yammer. And so at work uh, on National Coming Out Day, which was right after Out and Equal, I coined a, I don't know, a few paragraphs, I suppose, and talked about my journey and posted it there. And hitting submit was, I was probably literally dripping in sweat. I was so anxious and scared about how people would react. Um, but I submitted it and I posted it and I have for the most part had nothing but amazing results. There are people that, you know, um, don't talk to me as much. I, my, my old manager shared with me that there's, there's one person that feels quite strongly against, against me, um, and it has affected our relationship. Uh, we still have a working relationship, but we certainly don't have small talk in, you know, like the water cooler talk like we used to have, and that's okay. Um, I will continue to try and lead with love and hope that she sees something a little different. Um, I also had people like Ryan and a bunch of other people be there for me. And I would say to that, too, that while she may have alienated folks, being who Laura truly is and really the beautiful person that she is and the personality um, and the inclusive type person, the, the freedom that she can now feel and express as she's her own self has drawn tenfold more people to her and the relationships that come out of that. Uh, so yes, there are folks who are going to be put off by that and may try to denigrate the action. Of, um, but I, you know, I just from outside looking in, the the engagement of Laura with new groups, new friends, new colleagues has vastly outweighed um, the stumbling blocks that other people may have found. I'm a really good human though, and sometimes I focus on that one. <laughs> you know, I, I, the, the weird thing about webinars is I can't hear if you're laughing, so hopefully you all giggled a little bit about, at that. So one, <laughs> oh, I, just one quick comment I saw, and, and kudos to Andrew for remembering our session from Out and Equal. Thank I you. remember. Um, Andrew, I'm thinking of you right now, my friend. The, uh, the, the quote that was shared was, um, if being an ally was a crime, could you be convicted on evidence? And I think that's a great way to quickly think and ask yourself if you're acting in visible allyship or calling yourself an ally. Ryan would totally be convicted. <laughs> <laughs> we would put a cell right in the center of one of the floors. Isabel, back to you. Perfect. Well, thank you both so, so much for that. And I want to give a special thank you to everyone who uh, participated in the webinar. There were a ton more questions for you, Laura and Ryan, that unfortunately we can't get to right now. Um, but I'll make sure that you get those. And of course, your email uh, contact information is available for participants. So just want to thank everyone and make a special plug for those of you who were excited to see content on bisexuality, on allyship, and on anything else, really. I want to encourage you to propose your own workshops and panels for Summit this year. Uh, please join us for that kickoff call next week. You can find information on our website, and we'll be talking about ways that you can be involved um, in sharing your experiences at Summit. And I also invite you to join us next month for the, for the, remaining, uh, for the remainder of our virtual Summit series that continues next month. Um, and finally, with that, I'll just ask our speakers to remain on the line for a second. Once we uh, end the call, you'll be taken to a quick survey, so I ask that you fill out the survey, and we'll share that with our speakers. Thank you all, and see you next week. Thank you very much. Thank you.